Welcome to Ali Fitness Podcast, a weekly production all about bringing health into fitness. Monica Sattler is a business and goal strategist, entrepreneur, author, speaker, and world record holder, empowering her clients to succeed in their goals through their rad potential that emphasizes authenticity and natural strengths. She is passionate about guiding especially women in a male-dominated environment through confidence building and self-empowerment. You can read more about her story, workshops, and speeches at www.radmonica.com and follow her adventures on Instagram. And I'm very excited to welcome you on the show, Monica. Welcome. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you for being here. So I first uh, heard about Monica um, to do with cycling, and we're going to definitely delve into that. But Monica, before we even get into your sort of entrepreneurial um, talks and adventures that you're on at the moment, can you start off by sharing with us your fitness journey and how it's led to where you got to today? Okay. Um, Wow, that's that's a loaded question because it could be. Uh, um, I started um, basically. I'm originally from Germany, and when I was 19, I went with a, a full scholarship in volleyball back uh, to the states and played there Division One uh, volleyball for four years. Um, later on, um, after after four years of volleyball, I got into adventure racing, which is a combination of different sports, all running around in the woods and doing orienteering. And I realized that I'm pretty bad in running and I'm not a big fan of kayaking. So, and uh, cycling was left there. And yeah, I picked up a road bike and got into cycling, road cycling. And since then, that has been now for 10 years. Uh, yeah, I've been riding my bike. Well, and uh, we, uh, we've we probably all heard about your your amazing 3,300 kilometer Volta Espana and I believe you were the first female in history to do the Volta Espana. Can you tell us a bit about that actual ride and what you were thinking? Sure. Um, just for those who are not really familiar with the Volta Espana, it's basically um, one of the grand tours. Um, so there's Tour de France, there's the Giro d'Italia and the Volta Espana. And yeah, one is in France, the other one is Italy and the Volta Espana is in Spain. Um, yeah, and currently it's only reserved for the male professional cyclists. The best of the yeah uh, the cyclists uh, can can go there, but there is no such a thing as a female race. Um, and I decided to ride every single stage as the male professional just hours before them. So I started before them, finished every single yeah stage that was then altogether three thousand three hundred kilometers in twenty one days. And yeah, no woman has ever done this before. So. Yep, <laughs> no one was crazy enough to do it beforehand. <laughs> wow, and what what sort of motivated you to do such a such a ride? Because yeah. it is an amazing ride, and 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 obviously there's a reason why women, well, why they don't have a competition for women. I I, I suppose what would that be? And, yeah. Yeah. In fact, actually, my the reason why I did it was to inspire others to go for big challenges. Um. To show that you know it's not all about success. It's not all um, always like a happy path uh, following going for a goal. But you know we have to go through errors, through mistakes, through uh, huge doubts to you know go for something big and seemingly impossible. Um, and that journey I was sharing. And while I was going through all of this of preparing for uh, such a uh, such a challenge, I realized actually someone told me, Monica, you you know that you are, will be the first one doing it. So the to set a world record was actually more secondary. Um, the first one was really to show what um, what it means to go for a big challenge. In fact, actually, I invited uh, people along. Everyone who wanted could uh, join me for um, any stages they wanted. So, yeah, there were people uh, coming with me um, for the stages. That was great. Wow. And do you know why Vultura Espana and, say, Tour de France aren't open for, for competitive women? Well. The um, it's so far it's probably I mean there's a, I guess a struggle going on between the media like what uh, if women cycling is on TV would people actually watch it um, but then you know if you don't give the opportunity to 
showcase uh, that women cycling could be interesting on TV, you will never get actually that TV coverage. So, um, and then I guess also because people think it's impossible for women to complete such a, a big challenge. Mm, and after doing it yourself, what do you think? I think um, to make it more just interesting for the, I mean, we are naturally weaker, um, uh, especially also in cycling. So there definitely could be um, maybe not 21 days and not maybe every single day, 160, 170 Ks, but it could be something shorter and, um, but still um, interesting for people to watch. So, but however, that being said, I'm not saying that women can, can't do it. Um, so yeah, it there should be definitely a, like an equivalent for women's racing. Mm, interesting. You say we are weaker. We're actually, women are actually better at endurance than men. Um, I believe so. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe. Yeah. I mean, look, I don't think for males, it's necessarily a healthy ride either. Um, <laughs> and I guess, yeah, I, sorry, I interrupted you there. I am. Um, I, I hear what you're saying, um, but when you're looking just at the um, at the speeds of what women are going on in cycling and male, um, you do see a difference. Um, I'm not saying that we are. Um, I think f if the longer it goes, the better women will will go. Um, I agree definitely on that uh, part. But when you're looking at the race individually, um, uh, there are um, speed differences power differences definitely right yeah yeah okay yeah. and so can you talk through i guess how you went about training for such an event and um and and any other events that you've done and and what sort of training both um in terms of the the fitness as well as the the health in terms of like say nutrition sleep and anything else you'd like to share Sure. Um, so I've done something similar a year beforehand where um, it was 2,650 kilometers and over 60,000 meters of climbing. So I'm not sure in feet and miles, but it's a lot of climbing in there. Um, so I had already pretty good idea that um, how to prepare for um, such an event, but still it has always something you always could something happen. I felt like. <clears throat> and, and had you already, it, and I believe you've done the Holt route three times. Exactly. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. Exactly. It was, it's uh, three odd routes back to back to back. Yes. Um, so one in the Pyrenees, one in the Dolomites and one in the French Alps. So that was a lot of climbing yeah, and about also 21 days. So um, I knew that at some point there will be a lot of mental fatigue and physical fatigue um, coming in. And then it's really about um, pushing through and um, staying mentally, especially strong. Um, in regards to the uh, physical preparation, I've done actually not too much. I, di I didn't have any structured training because I wanted to keep the the training fun. I wanted to keep the cycling fun because if I go into that kind of challenge and I'm tired already of cycling, then that would make it harder. So I almost kept myself a little bit um, short on cycling so that I would be really excited to go into into that challenge. Um in regards to nutrition, um, I tried a few things out, um, especially, you know, when you're tired, what will you eat? Um, but still trying to eat healthy. I really, I ate always normal food. I had, had two gels in 21 days. So I always tried to eat local food there, tortilla or um, even fish sandwiches. But I tried to stay away actually from the sports nutrition um, there. Yeah, mm, and, I think and, that and was, what about um, liquid? Um, water, Just water. <laughs> wow, and, yeah. and and so when you say you did the say roughly 160 kilometers a day, was there an average speed that you sort of held, or an average power that you were sort of trying to maintain? Well, um, so my goal was just finishing before the pros. So I was. Um, uh, a minimum of 25k an hour I wanted to uh, stay as to stay and it was anything from 25 kilometers per hour to 30k so considering then I did it by myself also facing like the wind by myself and sometimes had to fi find my own path because there were no signs to show me the way um, yeah I was able to always um, stay way ahead of uh, the professionals when they started 
Wow, what a, what a feat! And in terms of uh, other, say, competitive races, have you done many um, competitive races where you've competed against other females? Yes, I've done. I did a few UCI races in the states. Actually, the Philly race, yeah, in Philadelphia, that UCI race, but also in the Netherlands. Um, but I must say, I'm more into really ultra endurance races, so or cyclosportifs. Um, so anything from yeah, two and a half miles. Um, um up those are i enjoy more because then it's really about i'm not saying that the other one is not mentally tough but you know after 10 hours 12 hours of riding you really have to tell yourself to keep going to keep pushing and i do enjoy there um to really work on my mental um ability to get through um, a, a cycling spot if like that amazing and what's next in terms of cycling I will be in June. I will be riding. I'm not sure if you heard uh, of Andorra. It's a small little country in the Pyrenees, um, surrounded by Spain and France. It's super small, and but it, it's in the mountains. It's in the Pyrenees. It has zero flat um, uh, uh, stretch. So I will. I want to ride every single climb there in one day, and that will be about uh, 300, I think, 30 kilometers. And I'm not, I forgot about, but about over 12,000 meters of climbing. So it's a lot of climbing. It's a lot of kilometers. And I would be the first female doing that. It has never been done before. Wow. How long did it take the first male to do that or a male to do that? Yeah. Um, the male, actually a friend of mine, um, he did it in 18 hours. So, and he is a pretty good climber. So I'm hoping just doing it under in under 24 hours. That's amazing. Are you going to do it by yourself? Well, um, I do it same like the format, like as the Vuelta. I invite everyone who wants to join me to come along. Mm, excellent. That sounds amazing. I might join you, but I'll probably uh, only last about 10K. <laughs> ah, no, you are pretty fit, Ali. <laughs> <laughs> so moving on from cycling then, um, in your book, you wrote about your life and how it's okay to fail, to doubt yes. and to make mistakes. And you say being the best does not mean everything is perfect. Can you elaborate a bit on that? Yes. Um, I think um, when you see, for me, like if I see life rather than adventure, uh, life and adventure rather than like a perfect execution of whatever I do, it's it, it seems all of a sudden okay to do mistakes. And those mistakes or errors or doubts what you have are okay just to follow the journey. Um I'm when you're more open to uh, um, uh, whatever is out there and really um, more appreciate the experiences rather than going doing everything, trying to do everything perfect, what society is telling you, you are really, I think you're more able to appreciate life more. Mm. So putting that into practice then, in your next challenge in June, if you get to sort of 24 hours and you haven't finished your 330 kilometers, or you, um, how, how's that going to make you feel? And, and how do you sort of, I guess, deal with those types of failures, you could call them? Yeah. Well, for me, the 24 hours is more like it's a target, but if I don't pass the target, it's okay. Um, I think it's always important, like knowing why do you fail? Is it really that you don't give your best or are there other um, external circumstances which make you not being able to achieve your goal? I think those two, sometimes, you know, life just goes between, okay, then, you know, maybe there's another goal you can achieve. Um, instead of trying to really um, uh, saying now it's, everything is over just because you haven't achieved something. Because even when the Andorra, something happens and I wouldn't be able to complete it, just the experience that, People were able to join me to share the experiences, you know, to be in such a beautiful country and riding my bike. That is already a success of a day. Mm, awesome. It's, it's really interesting and it's, it's interesting how you approach the rides that you do and, and how you mentioned that you, you just sort of want to make sure that you, it's an adventure and that you're having fun and I really, yeah. I really like that attitude and I guess you, you bring that into to everything which leads me to your empowerment workshops that you're running. You're clearly passionate about women empowerment and I know you have a workshop coming up to help women get more self-confidence. Yes. And so how did – how did how did being a cyclist help with, I guess, coming to <laughs> this women empowerment 
Very good question. Um, so I, besides that, I was an IT management consultant beforehand, which is already very male dominated. In the cycling, every single group ride I've been doing is I'm the only female. I've lived now in five countries and about 30 places. And there were always, I was always the only or one of the few females. Um, and I'm naturally, I'm saying this now, I'm inferior to my peers. And because of the cycling clothing also, um, I cannot, cannot hide that I'm basically a woman. So there are already um, parts of it uh, where would speak against me and, and making me inferior to, yeah, to the group. However, um, I still gained the respect and I was seen as an equal. Um, and I think um, the lessons I've been learning through that, I'm sharing basically with um, with other uh, women who you know want to be uh, perceived as um, as an equal and want to excel in any type of environment. I don't want to call it just male dominated, but mainly in yeah in any type of environment, especially when you're a minority. You, of course, you have to show maybe more strength and more um, uh, confidence towards them. And that is why I'm. Yeah, I'm very passionate about um, helping, you know, other women to that's to excel. Yeah. But you said that you you sort of got that respect from from the male riders that you ro- rode with. Was that because you uh, sort of proved yourself, or do you think if you had a, had maybe less ability, you, you would have got that same respect or not? Um, sure. I mean, I think it is one of the key points is. Um, because they see that I work hard. And that is one of the, I have like five key points where I believe this is how you can gain respect and, and get the self-confidence needed to, um, yeah, to be seen as an equal. I, it's not the best wording, but, um, and one of them is um, to uh, not to make yourself inferior, to be confident in, in your group, whatever that group might be. Um, and working hard and being the best version of yourself um, shows to others also that you know you want to be there you want to um you sh- want to show it and that gains you gain respect no matter what level that will be but when people see that you work hard um uh, you will yeah um they will respect that okay and what were the other four things um one of them is um being real being authentic it is incredibly important instead of trying to be someone else to really be yourself um the other one is to focus on yourself um, instead of comparing yourself with others um one of another one is um about to be the best version of yourself and that does not mean that for example that you have to work until midnight but to realize okay now for example at 6 p.m or whatever time it is you may be becoming inefficient because you're tired it's okay to stop you know but to really looking rather in, in yourself of seeing like, okay, this is the best I can give um, every single day for yourself. Um, and lastly, yeah, being not, um, not making yourself inferior. Oh, not making yourself inferior. And the fifth one is about staying true to your morals. Um, if something is not correct, if someone's telling you um, something um, which makes, uh, puts you down or so, speak up or seek help to solve that situation very quickly. Mm. Yeah, they're five really good points and um, I'm sure a lot of women and, and men can, can relate to that in, in not only sport but, but in any any sort of workplace exactly. environment. Yep. And, and so tell me a bit more about your women empowerment workshops. Who are they for and, and when are they running and, and, and why are you cool. doing them? Yeah. Um, I see there's a lot of a huge potential for women in general. I mean, um, a lot of companies in the world has um, grasped on it that, you know, there has to be, there should be like equality. Um, that's, that's why I want to do it. And I think because of my unique experience, especially as a cyclist, but also as an IT management consultant, I can contribute to it. Um, I'm, you usually do it for corporations, for companies who are interested in, yeah, in creating more equality and more empower, empowerment in their workplace, but also for, uh, for individuals. Um, let's say, for example, in sports or in, in, yeah, in the workplace or in life. Mm. Excellent. And what sort of results have you seen from it? Maybe if you could share some, um, maybe individual results or, or even workplace results that you've, you've seen. I think actually the best 
um, and probably the hardest um, result was um, my sister. Um, because sometimes, you know, when you're your um, family, you're not listening to the other person. But um, my sister wanted to move to another country. Um, and she is she is 30. And uh, she thought because she is um, now well into her career that she's not able to do it. Um, but yeah, we worked through it. And um, I gave her the um the she she learned the uh, um, that it's okay to to go out there to explore the world and that you don't have to again this uh, this perfect path but that life is an adventure that you don't want to be 90 years old and looking back and think like that you regret not having done something in your life awesome so what what did she do oh she went <laughs> she went to australia for one year and now because um, her English has improved and um, she has made such um, more connections, she was actually returned to her workplace and be able to take on a global position. Great. So coming yeah. coming back to, I guess, cycling and, and all the different sports, even the volleyball that you started with, how fit and healthy do you think that people are at sort of high level sports maybe maybe cycling um what what's your what's your opinion about the not only the fitness levels but also the health Ooh, that's a tough question i guess it's very um individual in regards to yeah how healthy um, people are really it really depends on especially in cycling in, in professional cycling everyone has an individual coach or it seems like um so but I mean, fit is is uh, all of them. Otherwise, they couldn't probably be part of the peloton. Um, but healthy, it it depends. I think on the individual how they take on their nutrition um, and their training. Mm. Can you share with us a bit about your training and whether you have a coach, and then also how you sort of look after yourself in terms of recovery and nutrition? Sure. Sure. Um, I don't have a coach and I'm very much, I'm very much a person who I believe listening to my body. Like if I feel like I'm not going out and can't go out because I don't feel well, I don't go out and ride my bike. But if I feel like now riding two and a K, then I ride uh, two and a kilometers. Um, I'm a big believer of that. Um, at the end of the day, they, if you listen to your body, you will do the right thing and will improve um, and not overtrain or um, something like this. But uh, this is, I know, I'm very much, I guess, the minority in, in that sense. Um, but I don't have also a power meter. I do have a heart rate monitor, but um, so it's much more for fun than I see it as a structured training, which has helped me now really to stay in sport now, okay, for for 10 years. But I I don't see any decline of my interest or my passion for, for cycling. Um, in regards to nutrition, it really cycles through. So there will be times, depending on, also on my training, if I have you know, all of a sudden I ride with the fast guys and I'm I'm hungry, I eat um, also sweets and stuff, I guess. But I do try to um, keep it healthy. Mm. So how often would you be going out in the peloton with, with the male cyclists? I do ride every Saturday. is a very hard ride here in Mallorca. Um so that is always like, this is for me in my race um, when I'm riding with them. And if I can stay with them because it's a drop ride, so they're not really waiting. So either you are there or you're not there. Um, that is my race um, with them. And otherwise, I ride um, pretty much with my boyfriend uh, three times or four times um, around the other days. Okay. And so what would your nutrition look like, say, on the, on the Friday night before the, the Saturday ride? I do like pasta. So I probably will have pasta with tomato sauce and veggies. <laughs> yep. <laughs> cool. And then uh, what's your sleep and recovery like? Um, so I do love uh, – I live in Spain, so siesta is quite normal here, um, especially on a Saturday after a hard ride, which could be 140K, 160K. I um, Yeah, we're eating, and then it will be a siesta time. So from 3 to 4 o'clock in, in the afternoon, I will be taking probably a nap. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I try to sleep eight hours a day. Um, and I, I take that um, very serious because I really see that if I don't get my sleep, then um, my performance is declining very rapid, rapidly. Mm. So you get to go riding every day in Mallorca then? I, it's five, five days a week, I think. 
because I also combine it with um, gym and uh, running a little bit, especially in the winter, just to mix it up a little bit. Mm, excellent. So tell us a bit about your strength training. Um, I uh, have Mondays, always my leg day, where I use usually just two machines and uh, going back and forth and trying to do it, um, I increase the weight until I can't uh, go anymore. And that's basically it. But it could be um, maybe half an hour of really solely those two machines. And Wednesdays, I do everything upper body and a little bit um, stabilization um, exercises and things like that. Okay. And so your your leg day, is that based on sort of any particular style of like training, like Doug McGuff's hit style, or is it just something that you've you've come up with? Or yeah, I think I this is uh, what gets me into the gym. I'm not. Um, I have to keep, stay myself. Um, have to keep myself motivated, and I just put good music on. And um, my my only goal is to get as high in those weights as possible. And then when I'm when I'm done, I'm done, and I'm I feel good. My legs are pretty tired, and I can go home. Um, I don't spend a huge amount of time in the gym, but when I'm in the gym, it's very efficient. And yeah, there's no talking or no resting. I'm just really um, doing my exercises I want to do, and I'm going home. And do you feel the crossover when when you get out on the bike? That strength from from the gym really paying off. Yes, definitely. Like on Tuesday, um, maybe not, but uh, by the time that Saturday ride is coming into play with um, with the guys, um, I definitely can feel it. Yeah, and those those rides sound pretty tough. So up to 160k, and what sort of um, kilometers or, or miles are you doing um, per per hour on the on the bike? Or I, oh, I guess you don't look at um, your power, so. No, I don't have power, but it really depends because um, Mallorca can be very windy. As an island, we have quite a lot of wind. So I think sometimes the average is not really telling you a lot, but it could be anything um, 30K an hour. So what is that, 20 uh, miles per hour? It does mm. not s- seem a lot of a lot fast, but yeah. Um, let's say this, those are um, all the guys I'm riding with, and they are winning here um, the races on the island. Wow. Least, so. Wow, that's amazing. And <laughs> and Monica, in terms of your health and fitness, how, how fit and healthy would you say you are? I think um I'm I would consider myself um overall quite uh, quite fit. Um the cycling is I would consider myself um yeah. It's very tough uh, always to compare to to whom, but uh, sure, because a cyclist is very um, very focused on one thing. So there will be probably exercises, especially something like CrossFit, also where there's no way that I could um, be doing some of this. But for for the cycling, I'm very happy currently with my uh, with my state of fitness. Excellent. And so, do you see yourself doing any more UCI races or any sort of big uh, events in the future? You know, Ellie, it's a very good question, but um, I, uh, I got the bug on when I've now just basically created my own my own challenge that Vuelta Espana. I had to create it all by myself. You get the bug of creating your own things, um, creating your own challenges, and so I probably will go more into into that more theme um, instead of competing against others. I just compete um, against myself. Mm, awesome! I really like that. That's great. Look, um, Monica, what you've uh, shared with us today has been really, really great. And before I sort of ask you your last words, I've got to ask you a bit of a question. Um, sure. So do you have a tattoo? I do have um, an eyeliner tattoo. I'm not sure if that counts. <laughs> well, I, I guess so. Um, but And it's probably uh, – what, what, why did you get the uh, eyeliner tattoo? Oh, basically to so I don't have to put my makeup on every day. Exactly, because it would just sweat off, wouldn't it, if you were cycling? Yes, yes. <laughs> Great. So um, any last words or advice that you can give our listeners? So obviously um, a lot of male and female listeners, um, some some fairly fit, others sort of working towards fitness and health. Um, is there anything – you shared with us your five points which were really – really great. Is there anything else that you'd like to share in terms of, I guess, what you're all about, which is achieving things beyond your dreams and, and proving that you can 
do whatever you, whatever it is you want to do. Yes, I believe um, it's uh, goals are very important, but the journey there is even more important. Um, it doesn't matter if it's losing weight or if it's yeah going to the gym or so. Sometimes uh, we're making our lives uh, harder than we should because we are so focused on the goal that we forget about actually adjusting the journey towards us. Everyone has talents and strength. So uh, when we do have a goal, try to figure out what is your journey to get there. Not because someone else is doing it this way does not mean that you have to go this way. And then you can, if you enjoy what you're actually doing, reaching the goal is natural. Yeah, that's, that's really good. So do you think that everyone should have goals? Um, it doesn't have to be um, uh, seemingly impossible goals, but by having goals, even like micro goals, you know, your day makes, I feel like, may more sense. You're, you're waking up in the morning thinking, oh, today I'm doing this or today I have to do this. And then also when you're going to bed in the evening saying like, holy shit, you know, I accomplished uh, those things. It doesn't matter what it is. It can be a super small or super big. But um, by having goals, it's more about your, your starting to focus. Um, and it's not just, you know, rambling on in life, but, you know, uh, feeling like the feeling of or getting the feeling of accomplishment and achievement. But then what if you don't achieve the goals? Um, but as I said, you know, it's not um, sometimes, yeah, sure, it, you can consider this a failure or as an experience in life. And then you just go on and um, living um, the experience you got, you can use for another goal, for another experience. Um, as I mentioned, like life is an adventure. It's not about this perfect execution. Go out there um, expose yourself to new experiences. And, you know, you getting, I feel like you're becoming more like uh, life. You're becoming um you know, you you always will find a goal. Um, sure, achieving is good, but um, when you enjoy the journey, then the goal is not everything. Awesome, I love that last line. When you achieve the when when you achieve the journey, the goal is not everything. That's awesome. Look, thanks again, Monica, for having um, for giving us your time and coming all the way from Mallorca. I know you could be out riding in the sun right now, so uh, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, Ellie. Thank you very much for being part of this. For all the resources and show notes from today's episode, please go to www.ali.fitness. If you like today's episode, please show your appreciation by going to iTunes, give us a five-star review and subscribe. Subscribe.